I want to thank all of you who are here and my family, my friends, colleagues who worked with me and lived to tell about it, <laughs> for the pastors and the people of the York District, for the bishop and the cabinet, and that guy going down the road. I thank you all for being here. But two people I want to specifically lift up, I've already given them nicknames, left brain and right brain. <laughs> to Jay Zimmerman, left brain, he's more organized than I could ever hope to be. In fact, I have a vision for heaven now where one day in the future, there is God on the throne and Jay with a clipboard right next to him. <laughs> and to Michelle Whitlock, right brain, I think she could build a service around a kazoo. <laughs> so thank you both so much. People of God, would you pray with me? Lord, take these thoughts, take these words, take this heart, and like the loaves and the fishes, multiply them among your people so that truly they might hear God and see God's purpose in their life. To you be the glory and the praise forever and ever. Amen. Now in many of our communities, I know you have those junk days. You know those days where you could put out the big items out there? You know, I don't know if it's every week, spring, summer, whenever. But you also know at that time there are those people in trucks and vans who go through the neighborhood picking them up. I am one of those people. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. You know, I, I do that because I see neat things there. Those people who threw them away, they didn't know what they were doing. Now, sometimes my kids really hated to be with me in those moments. You know, they'd slink in the back and they'd start praying, Lord, may none of my friends see me now. <laughs> but you know something? Just like seeing something useful and something that's somebody else throws away. Vision is the ability to see the opportunities, the possibilities. Vision is being able to hope. Ezekiel's vision is a powerful message to me. The hand of the Lord is upon me. God wanted me to see to look into that valley of those bones, those tri bones. See, in the Near Eastern culture, there was a powerful message there. You see, back then, when two armies would fight on a battlefield and one defeated the other, they almost always took time to let the defeated army bury their dead. Even when they were going to take the defeated army into slavery, they still gave them time to bury their dead. And when they were all wiped out, even the victorious army would dig a couple pits and throw them all in. And why? Because in their culture, they believed everyone deserved the dignity of being buried. But in those rare, rare moments when the victor had no regard for the persons they conquered, when they had utter disdain for them, they'd let them on the battlefield to be exposed to the beasts and the birds and everything else. Sending a message to those people and those who watched that we don't care about them in this life or the next. It was the worst message of hate that you could possibly send. And it was into one of those places that God took Ezekiel and said, I want you to see this. 
and they're looking. In that terrible scene is when God asked that question, can these bones live? Now Ezekiel tried to get around and say, Lord, you can do it. You know, you're, you're God. But God was not going to do a miracle that day for Ezekiel. But God was ready to do a miracle with Ezekiel. And so together, together, a man and God worked a miracle. But what it had to be first to be able to see. And we know that sometimes you have to look hard. For in those dry bones, we know now that in, even in those marrow, that there can be life. There can be a way to start again. There can be life, O oh Ezekiel. Yes, there can. And you know the rest of the story, and I thank Barry for sharing that. But those battlefields were not confined to the Near East. No, those battlefields are people's lives. And I see people time and again who walk around in hopelessness. Oh, they may go through the motions of life, but when you look at who they are in their heart, there is something missing. There is a hole in their lives that only a God can fill. And you know, I praise God when someone tries to fill that hole in their lives. In my life, I could have gone many directions. And the reason I'm here today, I truly believe, is because of loving people who were Methodist and also a crazy 35th ballot. <laughs> I was six years old. And it was one of those times when my father was away at detox, which he did sometimes whether two, three, or six months. And in those times, my mother, who scrubbed floors at the county home, tried to cope. It was a particularly difficult winter that, when I, that time when I was six. And I remember, I remember that there wasn't any heating oil. And so my mom decided to try to make a game of it. She called it camping inside. Now, don't do this at home. But what she did was she turned up the gas fire burners on the stove to generate a little heat. And she had us put our winter hats on and get under a bunch of extra covers and we were going to camp inside. She made it fun, but the truth was not fun. But later that evening, when I was supposed to be asleep, I heard outside some commotion. And what I heard were several men out there bringing five-gallon cans of heating oil to the house. Somehow they had found out, and they were there. And they were there again and again and again not so much with heating oil, but love and support. And in a time before we talked about transformation in vital congregations, they were simply doing what the Lord had asked them to do, to make a difference in the life of a little boy and his family. And the folks at Grace Church in Carlisle did that for me all along. Now, there were times I tried their patience. Okay, I remember one instance when we had a game. You see, there in the basement, there was a long hall right next to the kitchen. 
And we found that if you took those stainless steel kitchen carts and put WD-40 on the wheels, they could go real fast. <laughs> and so what happened is they had me on the top of this cart. Now, you need your imagination here because I used to be a real little guy. Okay? And I was on top like this. And these two guys were pushing me. And we had so much fun, except one day. The senior pastor, Dr. Kaufman, came down that hall. Why he put his foot out to stop that cart, I will never know. <laughs> because the cart stopped, but I didn't. And I had that exhilarating feeling of flying through the air for a few tenths of a second till I hit the wall. Not figuratively, literally. I sort of hit it at an angle like this. And I sort of fell down. He looks over me. Hello, Charles. <laughs> and you know how hard it is to talk when the wind's knocked out of you? <laughs> and I'm trying to point at the two guys who pushed the cart, but my friends were long gone. <laughs> I don't know what I did, but I wound up scrubbing carts or something. But you know something? No matter half the stunts I did, I could never stop the love of God's people. For you see, in me, they could see life. And they could see life in abundance. Another battlefield in our midst are the congregations in which we serve and in which we thrive. But not all of them are thriving. Indeed, the statistics tell us that in our denomination, 15% are what they call vital. And what that tells us is many people don't see life. And instead of dry bones, they see empty pews. And they can never move past that. Look where we used to be and look where we are now. And they never ask that question. Where can we go? Yes, like Ezekiel, perhaps they come to that battlefield of empty pews and they say, like Ezekiel would say, let God do it. They'll say, let the pastor do it. But while we have some wonderful pastors, I never met one who could do it alone. I truly believe there's an opportunity before us. For you see, I love church history. And when studying the history of a lot of the churches in our area, I was confronted to the fact, with the fact that most of our congregations started with a roughly 8 to 12 people. 8 to 12 people. And I would say to you, there are 99% of our congregations are more than 8 to 12 people. Regardless if you call yourselves thriving or declining, we have more than when we started. But what's the difference? We're not willing to look for life. We're not willing to look into those bones and say, yes, God can. Now you might say to me, it was different then. I mean, that was back when people could do it. When it wasn't as hard and difficult as it is now. Rubbish! I'll tell you a time back in the 30s when we were building congregation and building church meetings, buildings, excuse me, and you know in some of the minutes of those churches, those trustees built buildings by signing collateral of their own homes. You know what that'd be like? Going home from trustee meeting, hi, honey. He, she, he'd tell him, well, dear, we, have, we needed to do something. I needed to put the house up for collateral so we could build a church. Oh yeah, it was easy then. 
Now, it's not a question of when it's more difficult or not. It's the ability to look into those bones and still believe that God can raise life. And I believe they can. And I've gone to places where people were discouraged. And I love to go to those places, and you know why? Because Christians are amazing people when their backs are against the wall. When they have big debts, when they talk about closing, when they say this can't go, when you push them, they can be very dangerous people. People who believe are dangerous people. People who hope can be very dangerous people and I want to serve with dangerous people because God does great things when we have the boldness to prophesy whether it's in our homes, in our pews, in our congregations, in our towns and yes, in our world. It's not a question of empty pews or dry bones. It's a question of whether we still believe in life. Real transformation. It's not simply doing the things that reach out into the communities. It's believing That's where God wants us to go. And that's where God is willing to go with us. There may be dry bones, but there are no dead bones. There is always spiritual DNA. There's always hope. And there's always potential of life. And that's a battle I'm ready to fight any time. And I want to fight it with you. As I close, over the years, people have called me many things. (laughs) Yes, even at church. One guy said I was a combination of Billy Graham and Larry the Cable Guy. And I'm still trying to sort out what that means. (laughs) But perhaps the one that has always stayed with me is when a woman smiled at me and said, you can really tell you came from the other side of the tracks. Yep. But somebody brought me home. Amen.